And, uh, but Pastor Linda has transitioned, and for those of you that don't know, Pastor Linda Adams, uh, she now serves as the Director of International Child Care Ministries for the Free Methodist Church of North America, which means that she travels the globe uh, on our behalf for anybody that uh, wants to sponsor children, and she'll tell you more about this, but she travels the globe from, well, the globe. There's Antarctica. I don't know that you've been there. No. Nope. Anywhere else in between, I believe she's probably been. So, um, but uh, trying to raise support to help sponsor children around the globe and give them access to food, clothing, education, all kinds of resources. Uh, so we are privileged in, in some respects, still feel a lot of ownership, that we sent her out to do that work Amen. and that mission. Amen. And uh, so she's back to kind of share that story with us today. So uh, without much further ado, you guys uh, just welcome Pastor Linda this morning. Amen. I'll start with a video. Actually, yeah, we're going to start with a video, Dave. Go ahead. I've been thinking a lot about childhood lately. Maybe you could picture mine with me. I grew up in the security of a loving Christian family and a close-knit community of faith. I completely took for granted an environment of political peace and security and I never went to bed hungry, or even wondered whether my parents would have the ability to provide for me and protect me. My world was small and safe. I played with my friends, hung out with my classmates, went fishing with my dad, cooked with my mom, played around with my sisters, and adored my baby brother. I had no idea back then that one day I would experience firsthand the very different reality for over half of the world's children in the 21st century. Most kids in the world today don't assume they'll get to go to school. That's a privilege that's just out of reach for millions of them, especially girls. Predictable, daily, nutritious food, unimaginable. Safe drinking water? access to medical treatment or immunizations, many kids don't even know that they're missing those things. Their tangible dreams are just for another plate of rice or a pair of shoes. Since becoming the director of ICCM, I've encountered thousands of children in dozens of countries. In some ways, they're just like I was when I was a kid. They love their families, they play with their friends, they find fun in all different kinds of places, they chase their dreams. Their beautiful smiles just warm my heart. But sometimes I look in their eyes and I see a sadness that just kills me. And I realize that these kids are experiencing the horrific consequences of adult realities. The safety and security that I knew as a girl is barely a fantasy to those kids. But I see a beautiful thing. The global church reaching out in love sacrificing to care for the kids. ICCM joins hands with our Free Methodist partners around the world for the sake of the children. Pairing a boy or a girl with a sponsor from another part of the world changes that life of that child forever. An education offered by Christian leaders in their own countries improves their chances in life. This is holistic ministry. Bringing the child into the embrace of the family of God and meeting his or her most basic needs. It makes me wonder, what if, what if everyone could see just a bit of what I've come to see and could take responsibility for one of these kids? By sponsoring a child through ICCM, you can change a child's life forever. Somewhere in the world, a child is growing up without some of life's most basic blessings waiting for you to act. Through International Child Care Ministries, you can make all the difference in the life of a child. Your sponsorship of just $30 a month will help provide food, clothing, education, health care, and the chance for a child in need to see the love of Jesus in action. Good morning, New Hope. Morning. Wow. I can't believe how wonderful it is to see your faces. A lot of you look familiar, and I'm so glad for those of you 
that I've known for years. We grew up together here. Some of you, I, re I baptized you, I dedicated you when you were born. And I'm just as thrilled to see new faces because the place, you know, dies out without fresh blood. And God brings new members into the body with gifts and energy and, and life. And so I'm really grateful that I don't recognize all the faces after I've been gone for six years. You know, I just want to say a few words kind of, yeah, off before I get started. Um, I kind of want to kick off my shoes because it's holy ground. It's holy ground. You know, I don't believe in, like, the sanctity of bricks and mortar. Like, this is a temple built by human hands, and that's not where God dwells. But when even one of us walks in here, and he comes with us, something happens. And in this very room, God has spoken to us. We have celebrated amazing victories. We have made vows for a lifetime. We have wept over losses. We have mourned our own sins at this altar and been forgiven. This is holy ground. And it's just such a pleasure. I'm just kind of blown away to be back. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. <laughs> and I told the band already this morning that I miss them 52 days a year. Guess what day of the week that is. <laughs> what wonderful singers and worship leaders you have here. Thank you, Pastor Scott, for giving me this chance. You know, I was scheduled to be with you last June, and it happened to be the weekend that my mom was promoted to glory. So we had a funeral that weekend, and I didn't come here, but we knew that this day should come, and then we thought about coming for next weekend, which is a big deal. I wouldn't miss that for anything. I would fly from Timbuktu to be here next week, that I should just come today and then have a few days to reconnect with people and just spend time with you. So I'm just glad to be back. Now I'm going to, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to be a little bit autobiographical, and Heritage, I, forgive me, I was going to ask your permission before I tell this. Okay, but I didn't get a chance, so I trust you, you trust me? Okay. okay. Once upon a time, there was this crazy little church landed on North Union Street once after we moved here together. We started out at the German house and we marched over here one day. Remember the first Sunday in here? It didn't look like this at all. It was a construction site. People were afraid. Those who were cautious about insurance and stuff really didn't think we should be in the building while it was still a construction site, but I didn't want to pay another month's rent over there. <laughs> so we came when it wasn't quite ready. And once upon a time, there was this church that was running an experiment that you could, you could combine different tribes of Americans in one church, and you could worship in the city. And then one day in 2007, the month of May, this family walked into the church. Oh, yeah. And God ramped it up to another level of experiment. Because now we just don't have American tribes who don't always get along with each other. The Lord brings us one and then two and then other people from different nations and tribes and languages. And Prudence came walking right up here after the service with Heritage, who spoke a little English. And Prudence said to me, we are orphans. We have no mother, no father. No motherland, no fatherland. The Free Methodist Church is our family, and you are our mother. <laughs> and I remember thinking, but I think I need to be older than you to be your mother. <laughs> and I didn't know what to say. And I said, welcome home. And I didn't know that God was going to use that day and that new set of relationships to transform me and open my eyes to the rest of the world in a new way. You know, you are a deeply, globally connected church. You have sent people all over the world, and I'm just witnessing that I'm one of them. So today, I'm going to give you a little shareholder's report <laughs> on your investment, okay? And for the kids, I want to introduce you to some of your sisters and brothers all over the world. And I'm going to show you some pictures of those kids. But I have to tell you about my encounter with Heritage. First week here, Heritage asked if he could have a key to this church. 
And I said, I don't think the trustees are going to be passing out keys. Why do you want a key? <laughs> he said, because I want to come and pray all night. And I said, well, why can't you pray at home? He said, because there's 11 people in the house and I pray loud. <laughs> they want to sleep. <laughs> and I said, well, this room is pretty much empty all day long. I'm up there in the office, but you can come here anytime I'm at the office and you can pray as loud as you want right in this room. And he came and he started praying for eight hours a day. Sometimes they came out here and he was shouting glory. And he was dancing and singing and praising God. And there were times when I came out and he had his Bible open and he was praying God's promises back to him. And sometimes he was prostrate on the floor weeping, moaning and groaning. And sometimes I came in here and prayed with him. We knelt at this altar on my lunch hour. I was real spiritual. I gave one hour. I thought, wow, I fasted even. I didn't even eat my sandwich. I came down here, and I'm ready to leave at 1 o'clock, and Heritage says, Basta, this is your job. And I said, but I thought my job was to answer my emails. You know, i got to do the bulletin, and i got to do the agenda for the AC meeting, and I've got to work on the sermon, and, you know. He said, Basta, prayer is your job. And they taught us a lot about prayer. That first Sunday night, when they all showed up for prayer meeting, they doubled our crowd. And they said, where's everybody who was here this morning? And I said, well, this is who comes to prayer meeting. Amy Grillo, she never misses, and there's a, half, a handful of us. And he said, well, are they Christians? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I think so, but they're Americans. <laughs> they don't all come to prayer meeting like you do. So that began this interesting cross-cultural sharing, right? Uh, we all had a lot to learn. They were gracious to learn a lot from us. We were privileged to learn a lot from them. And I could stop right there with this one slide and just talk, but this would take all day. But I want to tell you that I look back to May of 2007 and I realized that God was up to something bigger than I knew. Isn't he always? I have to tell you that one time Heritage said to me, Pastor, the Lord wants to speak to you in your dreams. And I said, well, I'll try to listen, but I really don't know how to listen when I'm sleeping. So tell him to talk loud or something. I don't know what to do. And then it was the Sunday that Jessica Breitenbach was here, May 13th, 2008. She was here talking about her ministry in Namibia. And at 3.30 in the morning, I woke up with this dream. And... Uh, Oh, before I finish the dream, meanwhile, back at this, there was one other funny thing that happened before the dream. Very early on in their time there, they asked if New Hope could raise the money for windows and doors at the Menembe Church in the Congo. Because they said, we, we raised, you know, we, we built the building, we got the roof on it, it's got a dirt floor, we don't mind a dirt floor, but when the animals come through the doors and the windows, they do stuff on the dirt floor. And that rain comes through and turns it all into mud. And, you know, we just really need doors and windows. And they wanted $8,000. So I said, could I please have a picture? Because I'd like to project it on the screen so I could tell the congregation, you know, they could visualize what they're raising $8,000 for. And they gave me an email address for Superintendent Bitebi Tebi. And I get an email back the next day. I have dispatched a man with a camera. It will take him six days walking. <laughs> I just took a week of a man's life because I'm such an idiot. I didn't know they don't have cameras up there. They don't have pictures up there. But it was starting to introduce me to a different reality, right? And so, and anyway, we did raise the money and we helped with that. Now back to May 13th, 3.30 in the morning, I'm sitting bolt upright in bed. And I had a dream and the first picture, first scene of the dream was... An African child, later I thought maybe it was a Haitian child, but it was a black boy. And underneath the child, he was, his picture was on a white poster. And underneath it, in all capital black letters, it said, hungry. And then there was a scene of a little girl like that, and under her picture it said, feed me. And I just thought, I know it's in English, I don't need Daniel to come and interpret, but what does it mean, and why is he... But I couldn't go back to sleep, and I thought, well, maybe this is just about Jessica's ministry. You know, we're supporting that. And, but I said, Lord, 
you know, I'm going to listen. Well, I got a phone call. They asked me to consider being a part of International Child Care Ministries, in fact, um, being interviewed to direct it. And it's a very long story, but I have to tell you that um, in this very room, the Lord confirmed. I was sitting at the piano, which used to be on that side, on Sunday night when the community of the Savior was, um, was worshiping here. And we sang the last song of the evening after the Lord had spoken through the prophets to speak to my heart. We sang, here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord. If you leave me, I will hold your people in my heart. And I just started weeping, and I said, okay, I'll go. <laughs> Let me tell you some of the scriptures that the Lord brought to my mind that week. You know, we all want to be disciples of Jesus, we want to follow him. And we believe that we honor his word, but there's all kinds of stuff in his word that some we just skip over. Here's one of those verses that the Lord impressed on me, and this is Bishop Golapali and his wife Tiba in India, who have thousands of children in their care. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. What a beautiful thing that the gospel is for the poor. This is, was the sin of your sister, Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. And I just thought, wait a minute. I thought I knew the sin of Sodom. I thought that was one of those triple X rated sins. And now Ezekiel says that the sin of Sodom was that they're just like me. Arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. And I was very convicted. And then this scripture Referring to the good King Josiah, who became king at the age of eight, by the way, in the Old Testament. He defended the cause of the poor and needy, and so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord? Now, this picture was taken in Burundi. You notice the bare foot on that girl? I have seen hundreds of children all over the world with one shoe. And I ask, why does she only have one shoe? Usually people say, well, she must have found it. No, if you give an African child a pair of shoes and their brother or sister doesn't have one, they'll share one. Why should I have two comfortable feet while you walk on the stones with both feet? We'll each have one comfortable foot. It's all over the place. That's the way they think about whatever they have. If it can be divided, in, they'll probably figure out a way to cut one in half and each, one, each wear a quarter, okay? But back to this one, I said, now, Lord, I thought I knew what it means to know you. I thought that it meant that when I worship you, I feel your presence. And when I read your word, it speaks to me. And when I pray, I connect with you. I thought that's what it meant to know you. But here he says that he defended the cause of the poor and needy. So all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord? And I had to wrestle with God on that. Is that what it means to know you? to defend the cause of the poor and needy. Justice, righteousness, it's all wrapped up. It's not just my relationship with God, just Jesus and me. And it's not even just us four and no more, right here, community. It's action, it's love and service and compassion and justice for the poor and the truly needy. This one's in the New Testament. Let's read it out loud together. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James 1.27. I had to say to myself, if this is the target on God's bullseye, I don't think I'm hitting the target. I look at any church's budget and I don't see any attention to orphans and widows, really. Now, yes, we have a social service safety net. We have other ways. Widows here can often earn a living, or maybe they have a life insurance policy from the deceased husband. There are things, but the church around the world takes this verse seriously. You know, we did a study of the Free Methodist Church in Rwanda a few years ago. The average pastor's family has eight children, five of their own, and three orphans. That's just average. You just scoop up the fatherless children, 
and take them under your wing and provide for them. And the church around the world gets that. And then this one that's become kind of a life verse for me. Let's all read it out loud. Whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Do you believe it? Do you want Jesus in your church? Fill it with kids because he says he comes with them. He identifies with them. Now, if you want a whole sermon from this passage that was read this morning, you have to come back at 1 o'clock. But Jesus takes it seriously when children are harmed and caused to stumble, too. He identifies with them. So our call is to reach and protect and bless and provide for little ones, starting with our own, starting with the ones in our own communities, in our own extended families and networks, and our own church. Get it? We start here. But there are millions in the world who also need our attention. And then this last one. Let's read this one together from 1 John. We've all heard of John 3, 16. This is 1 John 3, and I didn't put 16 up, but 17 and 18. It's all the same thought. Let's say it together. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Love is so much more than a word, and it's more than a song. We want to learn about how to put love in action. And I know that that is the centerpiece of this church. You want to love God, right? Love each other. Serve the world. Loving service is what it's all about. Now, I get a chance to show you a little bit of what I'm experiencing for the last few years. I love this quote from Frederick Buechner. Your calling is the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. Now I'm going to introduce you a little bit to the free Methodist world that's a part of that other all huge world that we inhabit, but you might be interested that in 1950, look at three quarters of the free Methodists in the world were in the US, UK, and Canada, almost all in the US. 1970, half. So it was 71,000 in the purple, that was the US, UK, and Canada, but now we're up to 45,000 in Africa. You notice the growth there? Now look at 1990, 178,000 in Africa, more than half of the free Methodists in the world by 1990 are on the continent of Africa. And we've, you know, inched up to 84,000 over here. And now look at 2013. There are 1.1 million members in the world, and 477,000, almost a half a million, are in Africa. And look at Asia, quickly catching up, 427,000, almost a half a million. And the next time we do these stats, Asia will overtake Africa. The church in China is growing rapidly. Church in India baptized 3,000 people in one day, just like the day of Pentecost. It's pretty exciting what God's doing around the world, and we get to participate, and you participate too. So. Our organization is just a partnership connecting the global church. So we've got about 20,000 kids who are sponsored or on scholarship or awaiting a sponsor. Um, whoops, let's go back. There it goes. 20,000 kids, 30 countries, 12,000 sponsors, 77 schools, and we're celebrating our 50th birthday at General Conference in July. Um, and so now I've been to 33 countries because I've been to almost all the ones where we sponsor kids, and then I've been to some where we have sponsors. Now, just look at where the kids are. Oh, that's kind of pale, but the big, big, big one over there in the pale blue is Haiti. And then you see Burundi is our second largest country in the world. And then those are the other large ones and several small ones. So come and see some of my deep gladness. For the next six minutes, I'm just going to let the slides roll, and you can see some of the kids who are your little brothers and sisters, and I'll give you a little running commentary. That's supposed to go after five seconds. Let's see if it does. Well, I'll make it. So this is our team working in Haiti. Haiti, you know, I could say a lot about Haiti. It's our poorest neighbor in this hemisphere. Let's just use this one statistic. 50% of the people in Haiti have access to a latrine, not indoor plumbing, a latrine. OK, we'll go from there. But look at that. The church in Haiti is running, we're running 59 schools where children are getting an education. And we have 17 students in a Christian university on scholarship, which is really exciting. They're going to be a part of the 1% in the world who have a university degree. 
Now let's look at 37% of our total is in Africa. It's in all of those countries. I'll show you just a couple of them, a, a few. Ethiopia, I met somebody this morning that used to live there. So we have some excellent schools and the church is growing in a place that's really a battleground between Islam and Christianity. But it's a beautiful thing to see children learning not just the three R's, but learning that the God who made them knows them and loves them more than anybody else. And uh, they can learn to love him for their life. That would be Kayla Siddig's been to Kenya. Maybe some others of you. Okay, that's Kibera Slum, second largest slum in the world after Mumbai. We've got four million people there with no electricity, no sanitation, no running water, and no schools. So we have a couple of schools there. And that's the really beautiful front entrance to our school. <laughs> I'm proud of that one. <laughs> oh dear. But that's the really beautiful site is the people who are involved. And the, the one in the middle with the really wild jacket is Bishop Nixon Dingil. And these others are the leaders of the school and the leaders of childcare. And the kids there at this school love the Lord and love going to school. And they have a waiting list of 350 kids. And the school director told me, you know, that these parents would send these children to school even if we never taught them to read and write. And I said, why? Well, the answer to that would be lunch. If you'll feed my kids lunch, please take my kid in your school. And so the children are really thrilled. And, you know, I'm not going to give you a lot of stats today, really just a couple. Let me give you this one. 25,000 children will die today of preventable causes due to their poverty today and every day. So feeding children is no small thing, is it? They need it. This is another of our schools called Kawangwari. Did you go there, Kayla? Maybe not? Yeah. So just more beautiful children made in the image of God. And boys will be boys. <laughs> Check the zipper. <laughs> yeah, but look at the, the face of Christ. Nigeria. Now, some of you heard about Phyllis Sorter being kidnapped a few weeks ago. There she is with her beloved Fulani children. And I spoke to her this week. She's fine. She's chomping at the bit to go back to Nigeria. She's home with Seattle, and they're giving her a hug for a while, but she's ready to go back because she's got a calling and a mission to reach. We have 600 Muslim children in our schools in Nigeria, and Phyllis loves every one of them. And God is doing a remarkable thing to bring peace between Christians and Muslims in Kogi State. The enemy tried to take a swipe at that by kidnapping her, but she's free, and we are excited that the work of God is going to go forward without being stopped by any criminals. <clears throat> Little girl graduating from kindergarten, and Bishop Kendall enjoying some of the beautiful kids. And me, you know, to have a bunch of little Muslim kids ask me for a Bible story? Boy, I haven't even ever had American kids ask me for a Bible story. <laughs> Around the world, auntie, give me a Bible story. And I love it. These are some other Nigerian kids just greeting you. Burundi, how many of you actually have been to that country? One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. Okay, let's see a few pictures from Burundi. Uh, this is Jafet's daughter. Some of you probably know Jafet. She's now teaching English at Hope Africa University. And you've seen the Burundi have their really wonderful cultural drumming and dancing. And they can leap, I'm kidding, I'm not kidding, 10 feet in the air. I don't know how. They have springs in their feet, I guess. There's a thing called busoma, which is a highly nutritious porridge. And we do several tons a month of busoma because malnutrition is a serious problem in most of Burundi. I talked with uh, the late Bishop Eli once when I was in this region of the country, and he said, well, the average uh, income, daily income for a family in Burundi is $2, but we work with the poor people. I could hardly get my head around that. <laughs> but here we are, people lined up for, have any, any of you seen the Busoma before or, or tasted it? I know Aristotle told me he tasted it. It tastes like Gerber's baby food. Yep, um, baby cereal. But it's highly nutritious, it's a whole food, and it saves kids from brain damage that comes from not getting enough calories. Okay, and so, big brother, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. And now, a few little glimpses in some of our countries in South America, Venezuela, a very communist-leaning country. Oops, I didn't, I got that one first. Okay, Ecuador, all dressed up in their different tribal get-ups. 
Nicaragua, where we have a school in Managua, and beautiful kids. It's called El Messias, it's the Messiah School. Um, oh, I think that that town of Monterrey is where Elizabeth um, Porterfield is from. Chile. And then Asia. We're going to show you some of what's going on in Asia. It's very exciting. This is some of our leaders in India. And we have the privilege of having well over a thousand children in residential care. And many of them have never heard of the name of Jesus before they come there, but they come to understand who he is. And they have a healthy, safe place to live, and they have a chance to go to school, which, as I mentioned before, is especially a privilege for the girls, because there's an awful lot of girls in the world. And in fact, these girls are in the south of India, which is known for child prostitution and trafficking. And um, I told you I was not going to numb your mind with a lot of stats, but let me tell you one that you'll never forget. There is many baby girls killed every year for the crime of being female in India and China than are born in the United States. Okay, let's just take that statistic. There are more baby girls killed in India and China every year than are born in the United States. So the value of girls and the value of girls' education is not high in India. So when the church reaches out to declare that girls also are made in the image of God, are precious and valuable, and have the capacity for education, the church is being pretty radical. But it's a beautiful thing to see Indian girls going to school. And I got to tell you, nobody appreciates it as much as they do. Here's a, here I am with a hostel warden and a cook. And the boys are valuable too, but I have to tell you that this boy is about this tall and he's nine years old. He came to the hostel stunted because 48% of the kids in India are stunted due to malnutrition. But the hostel warden said, just give us about two years with three meals a day and he'll be regular size. So I'm pretty excited to go back to that hostel in Bangalore and see that boy. He's a really good dancer, even if he is this tall. Yeah, and those are some of the big guys who have already benefited from a few years worth of three meals a day. <laughs> and a lot of joy, worshiping the Lord in a place that is more than 90% Hindu and 1.2 billion people, lots and lots of people, but the church growing rapidly. And I've had the privilege, okay, Heritage, we were in here one day and you had a vision of me preaching at a stadium in India. So far, I've gotten up to 3,000 people at once, but I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. I wrote it in my journal. July 17th, 2007. Heritage had a vision of me preaching at a stadium in India. How weird is that? Let's see if he's a prophet. <laughs> That's what I wrote. I'm going to come back. I'm going to show you a picture when I'm actually preaching in a stadium. And you're going to tell me if that's what it looked like. <laughs> okay. And they gave me a doctorate. That's, you know, in Africa, when they really love you, they give you a goat. In India, they give you a doctorate. It's just the thing, you know. <laughs> uh, praise God. The gospel is good news. And it's going so that one day, people from every tongue and tribe and language and nation are going to be gathered around the throne. And isn't it going to be glorious? We get a little taste of it. I can't tell you how fun it is to worship with the people of God all over the world. And this place, Myanmar, is Buddhist to the max and communist, but the Lord is opening the eyes of the blind and showing little children in our preschool daycare center about the love of God. The, the director there told me, give them the gospel. I, I had a bunch of Buddhist parents and a bunch of graduating kindergartners in 20 minutes, and he said, give them the gospel. I'm thinking, how do you do that? I'm not quite sure, but they're in the process of living out the gospel by loving the children, and I got to be a part of it. That is special stuff they put on their face. If you ever see Tanak on, on a face, the child is from Myanmar. That's the kind of path that our coordinator goes on to distribute money to pastor's children. And he said, we always take three people because when the motorcycle slides down the hill, it takes three guys to put the ropes on and pull it back up. <laughs> so people are taking risks and doing dangerous things. Excuse me, excuse me, Amelia. Okay, and finally, the country of Vietnam. 
And I don't have time to tell the great stories except that, did you ever think that the communist nation of Vietnam would be open to the gospel of Jesus Christ? This is our superintendent there. And I love the picture because he's lifting up the child. He's looking into the eyes of his beloved son and he's using his strong right arm to protect and provide for that kid. And that's what the church is called to do, lift up the kids and use our strength and our resource to bless them and protect them. And it's a privilege. His daughter is our youngest national coordinator in the whole world. She's 22, and she's in charge of our operation there. And these are some pastors. And this is Lady Ha that I told you about, who has planted eight churches in Hanoi. And I got to wash her feet, one of the highlights of my life. And there are the children receiving gifts and some of the pastor's children who are sponsored in Vietnam. So there's four ways that child care works, through schools, child development centers, hostels, which are residences, and pastor's kids. And some of you are already sponsors. And whoop, there we go, child development centers, <laughs> hostels, <laughs> pastor's kids. OK. Those two little boys are in a place called the Lahu Hostel in Thailand. In their tribe, in that area, 85% of parents have confessed to selling a child. It's a really dense region for child trafficking. Now, sometimes people make horrible choices because they are squeezed between impossibilities. I never could imagine a child being sold knowingly by their parents. I mean, can, can you hardly get your head about that? But if you have six children and they're all starving, and somebody says, well, give me your 12-year-old son and you know, I'll pay you $100 and I'll give him a job in a brick kiln. You say, well, he's a big boy and you know, hopefully they'll feed him and he can look out for himself and it'll keep the other five kids alive. You know, people make horrible choices when they're in desperate poverty. So we have the privilege of being part of the church relieving people's poverty to the point where they don't have to make such desperate choices. Sponsoring a child is the first line of defense against child trafficking, which is what Kevin Austin, who's the head of the movement, said. We're going to be out at Roberts this Wednesday for uh, anti-trafficking day, an awareness day for local action for Christians who are getting involved. It's $25. You can see there's a flyer on your bulletin board out here if you're interested in knowing more about what you can do against the horrific crime of, tra of child trafficking. So, we can stop trafficking at the source by helping kids to go to school, to have adults who are looking out for them, and many other ways. So we've got projects now in Thailand, India, the Philippines, and Colombia that's, that really protect children from that horrible future. So, it's a dollar a day. Now I know that this church gives and gives and gives and gives, and I'm really, I'm going to be as soft sell as I could possibly be today. Because the truth is, you're supporting local people in poverty. You're supporting Ivana on the Mercy Ship. You're supporting people in missions in a lot of places. And I just declare that God will bless you for that. He will channel resources through you. He will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory. I know it. But it's also my responsibility and my joy to advocate for the kids and say they're a couple dozen of them up on the table, and Megan and Debbie. Would you raise your hands, Megan and Debbie? They both live here locally in Rochester. They go to Pierce Church, and they're available to speak in churches to advocate for the kids, and they're here with me today, and it's just wonderful to have them. But they've got a table up in the community room, and we've got kids who are just waiting for a sponsor. And it might be that God would convince you that that's something you could do. A dollar a day. Here's the problem for me. Now that I know it's a dollar a day, every time I put some money in a Coke machine, I go, ooh. Could have sponsored another kid. A dollar a day slips through my fingers like you can't believe. It's amazing how much money slips through our fingers, especially coins. And yet, there's another child whose life could be changed for that. So maybe you can do it, you know? So there's a thank you that just says, you know, in any language you could possibly speak, and there would be many, many others, thank you that some of you already sponsor a child. Thank you that you're recognizing the value of kids in your own midst and pouring your life into them to reach them because Jesus says, when you welcome a little one in my name, you welcome me. And don't ever cause a little one to stumble. You're pouring your lives into your own kids and grandkids, to your neighborhood kids, to the kids where you work, 
the kids where you worship. And I just want to say, way to go. Keep it up. God bless you. You're doing something that's so close to the heart of God. Every child you protect, Jesus takes it personally. Every cup of cold water you give, he takes it personally. He's blessed. So my deep joy is to allow my life, my time, my energy, my resources to be a part of God's kingdom. You know, we used to pray this almost every Sunday. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We all cry that out to the Lord all the time, and that's still my daily prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And however you want to use me, I'm with you. Just take me. I'm yours. Here I am. I'm yours. Let's pray. Lord, we give you praise that you are powerfully and generously at work all over the world to draw people to yourself and to raise up communities of people who are transformed by a new identity as your holy people, one holy people. It transcends national labels. It transcends sports team preferences and political party labels and languages and tribes. It's bigger than that, Lord. You're one people. And I thank you, God, that you allowed us in. And I thank you that you are allowing others in. And I pray, Lord, that you will bring many, many, many more people to faith in Jesus who are right within the shadow of this church. I pray, Lord, not only in the shadow of this building, but in the touch, in the reach of people's lives seven days a week. I pray, God, that you will raise up in this church a mighty, a mighty song of praise to you and a mighty outpouring of generosity and compassion to work justice around the world so that love is in action. Love makes the difference. And I thank you, God, for all who already sponsor and for any others who can do it. Lord Jesus, we know that we're doing something close to your heart and your reward is many times over. So thank you, Lord. We can't outgive you. And we praise your holy name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>